We all come to events like Boom for our own reasons. We all have our own needs, wants, and desires that draw us into these spaces. What might it be to have what we seek from these experiences in these delineated spaces as part and parcel of our daily lives? What changes would we have to realize in the world in order to provide ourselves perpetual access to these experiences rather than needing to seek them out in such delineated spaces where we can get away from the obligations and coercions of our daily lives? Given this question, I'd kind of like to propose a hypothesis. Seeing that we're all here, it's probably not going to be particularly earth-shattering, but I'd like to use it as a jumping-off point. Psychedelics are catalysts for personal transformations, but we must embody the understandings they facilitate. I think that the reasons why people come to places like Boom and the reasons people use psychedelics are very similar, if not one and the same. <clears throat> for me, Psychedelics have offered profound insight into myself and others, and have raised innumerable questions about the world in which we live. My first significant experience with mushrooms gifted me with what I consider to be my first radical synthesis, or a state of understanding where a number of previously disconnected and disjointed understandings about the world came together in a way where they revealed themselves to not only be interconnected in a very seamless manner, but to also point towards the root causes of a number of destructive processes and institutions. I was 19 at the time of the experience uh, at university, and I had been staunchly anti-drug for a lot of my childhood until I tried cannabis and then realized that the drug propaganda was just propaganda. So after doing several weeks of research on mushrooms, deciding that, that they looked to be fairly safe and something I wanted to experience, I ate three and a half grams in my dorm room and headed off to the 90 plus acres on the edge of campus. As the experience started to peak, uh, I found myself coming across a tree with this, this huge root mass that presented itself to the path and, and as I approached the tree I saw it was teeming with all sorts of insects, that fungus was growing through the roots, that lichen was growing on the tree, and all of a sudden I felt this weird consciousness that felt somewhat familiar but very strongly other and I felt as though I'd been thrust into the center of a nature documentary. And all of a sudden I was presented with understandings about life cycles and how all of these systems, the insects, the tree, the fungi, they're all interconnected in a way where they can't be pulled apart and cleanly stated that, that this starts at this place or time and this starts at the other place in time. And as I was here in this really tiny patch of woods, you know, contemplating these interconnections, I suddenly felt this deep, profound sadness at knowing that these interconnections exist in ecological systems all over the world, and that these ecological systems are, are under attack, that they're essentially being decimated by humans. And as this profound sadness sort of enveloped me, I realized that it, it, it wasn't just humans, that it was humans organized into corporate hierarchies and that they were engaged in acts of for-profit insanity, literally, you know, poisoning the water we, we drink, the air we breathe, the ground that we derive sustenance from. And as I felt the weight of this understanding, the first instinct I had was run, unplug, you know, get out of this system. And I immediately realized that there was nowhere for me to go, uh, especially in the US, vagrancy and homelessness are criminalized. Land, which had formerly been the global commons, has been roped off and declared off limits by people with superior resources. And so suddenly I found myself with a, a strong desire to remove myself from the system, but realizing I didn't have an option to. As I sat with this, I realized that, that I was actually, you know, in school in order to obtain papers to function within this destructive society that I was here so that I could get a piece of paper that would allow for a career so that I could obtain food, clothes, and shelter within an industrial capitalist paradigm. And as I, as I grappled with what that meant and what my role was in this ecological destruction, destruction which, you know, to some extent has been going on since as far back as, as humans have existed, as food, clothes, and shelter always incur an ecological cost, but now in this structure, we've raced so far beyond these necessities to the most absurd ends of mass-produced technological trinkets that I was stuck in this position of, of trying to un un understand what it all meant 
and how it related and how I could function in a way. And again, I was hit by the fact that I, I couldn't unplug from this, that this capitalism uh, in how it intersects with industrial civilization is essentially a race to the bottom that seeks to enfold all sorts of, of enterprise into capitalist infrastructure and that ultimately the only way to, to escape from this, the only way in which that, you know, I could wield power would be in the marketplace. But as a consumer, you know, I, I have zero power. My minuscule purchasing power is completely irrelevant. And so, you know, people who like to talk with their, uh, about voting with your dollars frequently ignore the fact that that's for people who have dollars in the first place. And they like to ignore the completely unequal global distribution of dollars, the living legacy of, of uh, colonialism and imperialism. And, you know, they never talk about the fact that militaries and corporations are the largest consumer entities on the planet. So again, I find myself struggling with, with what it means to be encapsulated in the system, unable to escape from it, unable to, to run, that everywhere I look, it seems as though I'm trapped. And as I realize what it means that, that there is this ongoing race to the bottom and it's attached to the machinery of industrial civilization, the sort of final realization about being trapped in the system was that there's nowhere that I can go. There's nowhere where I can take myself or I can take people I care about or for any other life on this planet to go in the event that industrial civilization destroys the life support systems on Spaceship Earth. So the conclusion that I was left with was to resist, that I needed to find ways of engaging with the world that would not only create a world in which I wanted to be in, but that would actively challenge the various systems that were cropping up as problematic during this experience. And for me, the experience left me with a very clear message that ecological integrity is perhaps sacrosanct and that given the situation of industrial capitalism, you know, this destruction of ecosystems will be ongoing unless it's forcibly forestalled. That is to say, it's not profitable to stop destroying ecosystems within a capitalist framework, and so we won't stop. And ultimately, for me, this understanding was made that much more profound by the fact that I could see the connection between myself and the forest. I could see plants breathing, I could feel this deep, intrinsic knowing that I was a part of all of this life. And for me, that represents this concept of experiential knowledge, which is, to my mind, much deeper than mere intellectual knowing. Um, and the, the thing about experiential knowledge, sort of its, its power and the threat that it presents to entrenched systems of power is that it can't be taken from you. That these are understandings, you know, whether we're talking about something like the intrinsic feeling of, of knowing that you know, all life is connected. For me, mushrooms profound, pro provided this profound and memorable experience. At the same time, mushrooms changed a whole host of other components of my life. The most initially pronounced was uh, an unquenchable thirst for more information about psychedelics. Whether I was in class or at home, I was nonstop researching the classical psychedelics, DMT, psilocybin, uh, LSD, mescaline. And, um, you know, about a year into this, I stumbled across a talk by Terence McKenna presenting a whole host of his ideas and theories on, on social events. And then eventually it moved into his thoughts on DMT. And as I'd heard very little about DMT at this point, I was completely fascinated. And I figured it would probably be years, if not decades, until I stumbled across this molecule. But about a year after that, uh, a friend called me up and said that a friend of his had some, and did I want to come try it? And I said, of course. So I wound up at his house, and uh, there were about four people there. I was offered this one hitter loaded with DMT. And as I exhaled the third hit, I passed the, the one hitter to my right and instantly I knew I had died. I was in front of my face. My consciousness had exited my body and yet it felt completely normal. It felt like one of the most comfortable experiences I've ever had. And as reality twisted up into this tunnel and I found myself rocketing through it, I came into a space that felt like home with a capital H. And really all I could do was marvel that this had happened. Uh, suddenly there's this beautiful fractal jeweled temple and it was, it was astonishing in a very real sense, but not just in how otherworldly it was, in how much it resonated with me and felt like something that I'd known. And so as the experience began to fade 
And as I began to sort of come down, my eyes fluttered open and I mumbled, it's so nice to know that this is always here. Sort of attempting to reflect on the fact that there felt like something was permanent about this place as though it existed outside of time. And when I was finally all the way back, the first thing I said was, there's so much I've forgotten. Referencing the feeling of intimately knowing this place and all of the emotional states and knowledge and everything that had been presented in this experience. For me, I mean, I was, I was in complete awe and we left shortly thereafter, but nothing would ever be the same. Uh, I got home and instantly started researching extraction methodologies, got all the equipment that I needed, and you know, two weeks later I was pulling Pyrex dishes out of my freezer, marveling at the, the white crystals present in them, and feeling this was truly magical. Uh, you know, over the next eight months or so, I found myself smoking and vaporizing DMT nearly daily, sometimes you know, multiple times a day, sometimes there would be periods of daily use. And the experiences were, were I mean, ineffable. They, they really ranged all over the place and presented so many questions. I mean, there were, there were never, I mean, any answers that there were, they were never unaccompanied by myriads of questions. And so during the midst of all of these experiences, I found myself looking for a way to, to sort of communicate about this because I didn't know anybody else that was having these sorts of experiences. The few people I knew who had used DMT had used it maybe once. And with, I, was, I was after a, a particularly mystifying experience sort of trying to figure out a way to incorporate it, trying to figure out a way to make some meaning of it. And I never expected you know, that, that typing questions into Google was going to yield any answers. It was more of a way of, of getting things out of myself. And yet, when I typed in something like, how is it possible to encounter disincarnate yet seemingly, seemingly autonomous entities on DMT, you know, suddenly I found a forum that was actually discussing this in an insightful and skeptical and, and meaningful way. And I was floored. I mean, without even knowing that I'd been looking for a support community, I found one. And over the next several months at the DMT Nexus, I found my interest, uh, my curiosity about DMT and other psychedelics really skyrocketing. I felt renewed academic focus in uh, entheogens in my university studies. Um, you know, I, I felt profound uh, impetus to, to eat well and take care of myself. For me, it, it really still stands out as one of the most actualized periods of my life. And in the midst of all of these experiences, I actually stumbled across a large amount of, of writings and talks by radical figures from the 60s and 70s up through the present. And something that I was really astounded by was the degree to which the social concepts and political ideas that were being discussed by a lot of them really seemed to resonate with the psychedelic understandings that uh, DMT and psilocybin and a whole host of other entheogenic compounds had provided. Again, the hypothesis was that psychedelics are catalysts for personal transformations and that we must embody the understandings that they facilitate. Psychedelics are incredibly effective at providing altered perceptual shifts and changes in perspective. Um, radical methods of engaging with the world are ways that focus on the root causes of the crises that we see in ourselves and the world at large. One of the most beautiful, to my mind, abilities of psychedelics is their ability to sort of highlight personal and social patterns and identify things that are either out of order or that can use attention or that need changing for one reason or another. The thing is that psychedelics can't put these understandings into action. That requires focus and intention on the, pers on the part of the person who's gained psychedelic insight. This is what I mean when I say that psychedelics are catalysts. They can open the door, but you must walk through. So radical psychedelic engagement means using our psychedelic experiences to figure out ways of targeting these root causes for the issues that we see in ourselves and the world. And what this looks like can and will vary from one person to the next, depending on a whole host of personal life factors, what sort of intersection and interaction they have with various social and cultural systems. But 
one of the most sort of baseline from a personal uh, standpoint is that these can include understandings about our own personal self-care and well-being. So for me, when I was in the course of my DMT honeymoon, or what I call the first months of, of very frequent use, um, I was presented almost nonstop with messages about taking care of myself in the world, about how I was eating, how I was exercising, needs to, to engage in open communication with friends, family, strangers, what it meant to actually keep a neat household. And all of these things, you know, to some degree, sort of presented as, as though I was bettering myself to offer the, the best I had to these experiences. And of course, being a busy university student, during the, the course of these experiences, you know, my, my ability to keep up with these message, messages would fluctuate. At times, I would eat poorly, or I wouldn't have time to you know, exercise and study for class. So I'd cut corners, I'd, I'd you know, forget things that I thought were important. I'd regress to less open ways of communicating with my family and friends. And during these fluctuations, I continued to have a number of really amazing experiences. But as things got a little more unbalanced and started to, to get uh, into the realm of, of ignoring a lot of these understandings, I had the experience of vaporizing DMT alone in my room, and suddenly I heard this unintelligible alien language. And I looked around trying to find the source, and I saw that there was this blue male entity in the center of this swirling vortex, speaking at me very sternly, gesturing, and all of a sudden I felt myself just completely awash in all of these things in my psyche, choices I'd made that I wish that I hadn't, compromises I knew I shouldn't have made, various things in my life I was neglecting. And as I felt myself getting lost in my head and trapped in these thought cycles, I, I started to, to try to do some breathing exercises and humming in an attempt to center myself and, and come back into my body. And as I looked at the entity again, suddenly I had clarity about what he was saying. And what he was saying was, the things in your life that you're not happy with, you have to change. No one can make these changes for you. And I know, you know, it seems like really obvious, right? But, but at the same time, when he said that, suddenly I, I felt this profound weight of all the things in my life I was unhappy with, everything that I could see needed attention and needed engagement. And as I started to come down, this feeling of being overwhelmed sort of gave way a little bit to, to a more ecstatic state as I began to realize that, wait, what I've been given is insight, that the stuff that I have to do is life. This is, you know, the task at hand is to live life, to figure out ways of engaging with this endeavor that, that make me feel happy to be alive and that perhaps position me to be uh, a positive role in the lives of other people that I encounter. For me, this experience really illustrates the manner in which psychedelic understandings can inform insight into our personal lives. However, they can also present understandings and insight into broader social issues. For me, this is like the mushroom experience I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, as well as a number of similar reinforcing experiences since then. Historically, we're standing on a precipice. We're locked into increasing uh, systems of austerity, into increased subjugation to surveillance states, and we're watching increased ecocide taking place all around us. We don't have the option to unplug. We don't have the option to drop out. The only option that I see we have is to resist, is to come up with ways of putting these understandings into the world that leverage them against the destructive institutions that already exist. Radical approaches and methods of targeting the root causes of these issues are things that I think psychedelic insight give us a tremendous bounty of understandings to grapple with. So, um, if we get the understanding that the interconnection of all life on this planet is sacrosanct, then I think we have to find ways to act that oppose systems that would isolate us by destroying these interconnections and instead find ways to nurture our own connections to the world around us and to other people. Or if we're given the understanding that environmental systems are sacred to all life on Earth, then we owe it to ourselves to oppose systems, people, institutions that would liquidate ecosystems in the name of profit. And even if we come to the understanding of something like all there is is love, then I think we have to find ways 
that we can oppose systems that tell us that we are incomplete and unlovable unless we buy stuff. Understanding, <laughs> naming systems of dominance and oppression allows us to grapple with them in ways that treating them as mere, let's call it collective madness in the abstract does not. So talking about systems like capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and a whole host of others, these are concepts that apply to a whole host of processes and institutions that we frequently encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, if we understand ecological destruction not as the illogical and insane acts of people who just don't get it and maybe we could plead with them until they understand, if instead we view this as the byproduct of capitalism, a system in which everything, profit trumps everything, then we can begin to understand what motivates people and what ways of engaging with the problems we see might actually lead to productive change. Or in the example of, say, uh, the criminalization of psychoactive substances, if instead of viewing this as perhaps the overprotective but misplaced efforts of otherwise benign governments, we instead you know, understand how this is linked to the prison industrial complex, which in the US is one of the most profitable industries in existence, and also uh, is a manner of controlling so-called surplus populations, we can begin to get understanding on why we see the sort of illogical action and speeches from politicians who in turn use these substances while locking people up. So ultimately by naming these systems and figuring out what structures are involved and how we can apply leverage against them as a result of our understandings, we can gain greater insight on ways that make sense to act. Psychedelics are incredibly effective at cutting through some of the internalization of these components of dominant culture. So with consumer culture, one example that comes to mind would be uh, the sort of perpetuated message that you're going to die, so buy our stuff to distract yourself from that, or buy our stuff to prolong the inevitable. And I think that psychedelic experiences, especially things like ego death, can really you know, present some of these these marketing messages as humorous and, and not carrying much weight. Uh, additionally, these experiences can literally transcend ideas of consumerism. I mean, you can't buy a plus four on the Shulgin scale. It just doesn't work that way. So although these, these experiences and substances can cut through these institutionalized systems of, of understanding and being in the world, these understandings are, are really sort of pointless if we can't find ways to actually apply them. So for me, I would say that psychedelic, psychedelic experiential knowledge is irrelevant unless we can translate it to action. And unless we act, and quite probably even if we do, we stand to see the social and ecological fabric of our existence damaged beyond repair. Psychedelics offer a, a broad range of experiences that can catalyze action and empower us in ways that we may not have known possible. I think that the categories that I've targeted as far as uh, how we can empower that action all stem from an underlying concept of boundary dissolution or the lines and barriers that we're accustomed to viewing as real in daily life, perhaps seeming more illusory. So first and perhaps most obvious is, is ego death. For me, as somebody who experienced life-threatening situations before and after experiencing ego death, I felt much calmer uh, encountering the possibility of dying after I had experienced ego death. And I also find that I have prolonged periods of, of less mental chatter and perhaps greater inner peace following an ego death experience, even if the experience itself isn't always the most pleasant. Additionally, psychedelics can help us process trauma in unique and liberating ways. Most of us find that we're living in societies that are perpetually traumatizing. We live with, with systems of patriarchy, white supremacy, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, industrialism, just to name a few. Um, and, you know, at the same time, many of us have encountered acutely traumatizing events such as war, incarceration, assault, and at times it can be really hard to sort of figure out where the systemic traumas end and the acute traumas begin. But psychedelics seem to prevent, present understandings and altered perceptual shifts that allow for greater processing of trauma. 
And in addition to the emotional and psychological components of this, something I think is really interesting, especially in the case of ayahuasca and DMT, is this capacity for physical healing, where it seems like under cer certain circumstances, the body will release excess energy uh, in the form of tremors, convulsions, and shakes. And it really seems similar to what people are reporting through somatic experiencing therapy, um, where following these, these physical symptoms, uh, the people who've experienced them are, are presenting that they have much less trauma related to the, the specific incident, or that they just feel calmer and more at peace in general. Um, there's a large and increasingly growing body of, of both anecdotal and academic literature to support this. And similarly with uh, psychedelics for processing addiction, there's an ever-growing body of both anecdotal and academic study that show that these compounds offer us really uh, unique tools for coping with addiction and finding ways to overcome that and then act. Um, with regards to addiction, it's worth noting that we live in societies that, that lead us to binging behavior, that stress us in ways that then encourage us to engage in, in activities like you know nonstop drinking, uh, the rise of internet culture has presented binge TV watching, um, not that it didn't exist before, but it exists in a new methodology. Um, and similarly, in the US we have for-profit uh, addiction clinics where people are given methadone and suboxone, essentially perpetuating never-ending cycles of addiction. A number of psychedelics, including ibogaine and ayahuasca and mushrooms, uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms, have been shown to be effective at helping to cease uh, addictive behaviors. And it's not, to my mind, that these things are a panacea for addiction, but that they present a really powerful tool for dealing with acute withdrawal effects, and that they also give us unique insight to processing the social roles and the social goings-on that lead and play large parts, usually, in our addictive behaviors. Uh, the last area that I think psychedelics bear examination for when looking to empower action is that they're able to uh, facilitate ecstatic experiences. And personally, I think that there's, it, it's worth differentiating between ecstatic states of catharsis and ecstatic states of joy, which is to say that the feeling of moving through fear is qualitatively different than the feeling of moving through happiness. And the former is relevant to processing trauma, plays a role in addiction treatment, and the latter is important for figuring out what we find meaningful in the world and finding ways to act on that, as well as having joyful experiences. I mean, if we're, if we're serious about the notion of building new word, worlds, then for me, the idea of joy for joy's sake is important. Ultimately, I think we need to find ways of interacting with the world that put our understandings into real world action and that are antagonistic to systems of dominance and oppression that we see in the world. It's not sufficient for us to eke out a living on the margins of capitalism while this machinery continues to destroy the world around us. A small example from my own life would be work that I do with a prison books project. Uh, we send uh, letters and books to prisoners in a number of U.S. states. We organize prison demonstrations uh, and we send letters to U.S. political prisoners as well as working to find other ways of opposing the prison industrial complex. For me, the notion of doing a prison demonstration really sort of presents psychedelic understandings uh, reconstituted in the physical realm, where banging on drums and yelling you know, presents sound waves that pass through the walls of the prison and reach people on the inside, sort of reconstituting some of this human connection that, that's been stripped away by these institutions. And we've gotten letters in, in return that have informed us how thankful people were to know that they weren't forgotten. From some cases, we've gotten letters that have let us know that groups that were already engaged in resistance and struggles on the inside took our presence to engage in you know, more overt acts at the time. But really, I think what these projects could look like could, could range from you know, things like uh, ecological conservation and resistance to uh, community health care, community food providing. Like, really anything that we can find ways to, uh, to apply these, these insights and manners that benefit us and our communities. Uh, and one other project I'd like to throw out there as, as food for thought is that 
greater intercommunal engagement is needed, or you know, we need to find ways of reaching out to other groups. Uh, for example, where I'm from, there's a, a large number of, of in the street activist types and uh, psychedelic homesteaders. And I think it would be really fascinating to see what would happen if psychedelically minded people who have homesteads, who have you know, acres of land, could invite people who've been traumatized, people who've been burned out, into their land and engage in perhaps skill shares and mutual aid between these groups. I think that there's a lot of room for growth on both sides of the aisle. And I think that that can also be true for any, any community in which we see this resonance. So, I mean, this could really be its own hour-long talk, and in the interest of moving on into some discussion, I'd just like to close by saying, uh, I think we need to engage in the task of, of building communities of resistance. I think we need to work on creating modes of being in the world that, that empower us, that bring us together in ways where we can figure out what we find meaningful and come together with people with similar ideas on how to resist. I can't tell you what that looks like. I don't know enough, nor would I ever presume to be able to tell you what works best for your own lives. But I think that as people come together, if we're serious about this endeavor, there will be new things that come to mind. There will be ways of being that make sense to people as they come together. I don't know what our new worlds will look like, but I've seen glimpses of what is possible. I think we owe it to ourselves and each other to bring them into being. Thank you. Thank you. I've also been asked to mention that uh, September 25th through 27th in Ibiza will be the World Ayahuasca Conference. I'll be there as well. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, could I first just ask who you are on the Nexus? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Snaz. <laughs> nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> um, do you think that DMT and psychedelics in general have contributed to the advancement of human intelligence or at least an awareness of consciousness or greater consciousness? I think, you know, the question of more or greater, right, it's one of, it's an interesting way of putting it because we have this vast indigenous knowledge of you know, these, these modes of being, of, of consciousness as experienced in those states. I mean, if we, if we take that in like an industrial context, I think definitely, I think we can look at like the computer and internet revolution, you know, this, this tech boom, but at the same time, that's one limited area, right? Like as we've seen the explosions of this technology and, and understandings of ways to manipulate stuff in the world around us, we've also increasingly been sort of out of touch within this globalized paradigm of you know um all the minerals for all of these various you know the computer here the led here like this is all pulled from the earth somewhere at great cost to people who are living there who have to deal with them so i think that yes and no but i think that the questions that they present it's it's almost like an eternally sort of uh it's an eternal road for growth because there's never going to be an ultimate answer as, as far as i know which um, was more than enough for me for now. <laughs> um, but I, I had an encounter where I, um, I had done a lot of preparation for the experience and I had an encounter that um, when I reached the last element of my own ego, of my own human beingness, um, I sort of asked the non-human beingness, the light, uh, can I enter? And uh, the light said, yes, you've prepared. And uh, because I, and I, I, I've done a lot of preparation before, and I'm sharing it because I feel that uh, personally, that psychedelic experiences are visions as opposed to uh, personal experiences. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you have anything to say about the set and setting sure. that we take it, and also the set and setting that we are in as human beings when we take it. 
Totally. I mean, so to give sort of like the standard line, right, set and setting is, is one of the most important components when going into a psychedelic experience. But I think you, you raise a really valid point, which is to say that, you know, as we live our lives, so many of us find ourselves in situations where it almost never seems like it can be the right set and setting, you know, especially with all of these destructive institutions and processes in the world. You know, we, we find ourselves with so much that, that sort of weighs on our shoulders on the day to day that at times it can be really hard to figure out what that looks like. Something that, that I would say you know, I've seen success with is, is sort of setting aside time for these uh, experiences where you have no obligations, where you can kind of prepare yourself going into it and, and sort of, even though it's not being truly free from all of these notions of what you have to, to answer for in life, it can help give a little insulation and perhaps minimize the, the sort of worry and fear that you're not going to be prepared. And we've encountered a lot of people who've said, you know, I, I smoke DMT and it seems to be uh, regardless of dose. You know, I took a 50 milligram dose and usually this would have been breakthrough, you know, out of my mind. But, you know, I encountered just the chrysanthemum and it said I, I couldn't pass through. Things like this. So it's interesting to see, you know, sort of how some of these, these uh, compounds seem to self-regulate as well. Hi. Hi, thanks for this great speech and for you being here. I have a question. Um, you talk about this institutionalized world that uh, is also trying to demonize psychedelic use for their own profit and you could say enslavement of people, if you will. Um, what is your opinion on people using DMT on parties as a recreational drug and the image that arises from that? And could that be a threat to more sustainable uses like the ayahuasca uses? And um, so, could there, like, uh, could what happened in the '60s happen again? Well, I mean, I guess I'd, I'd say that I don't see a lot of threat as far as like to the availability of these things. At least in the U.S. and through much of the world, these compounds are all already illegal. Um, so in the U.S., the way that the Substance Act is written, Controlled Substance Act is written, any material that contains any quantity of a scheduled substance is illegal for you to possess if you know it contains that compound. So, you know, the plants are still coming through, people are still making use of them. I don't think, you know, drug interdiction will never be able to keep up. As far as, as the, what it looks like for people to be smoking at, at parties or, you know, on the dance floor, I can't really tell people what's, what's best for them. I know personally I don't find those to be the most conducive uh, experiences. And I think that like, ultimately I would, I would question, you know, why? Like what are we getting out of these experiences? Is it just to see some crazy stuff or is it to realize, I mean, because to me like there kind of is no tip of the iceberg because there's no telling how deep it goes. It's all, I mean, it seems to be bottomless. And so, you know, for people that, that do use things recreationally. I think recreation is fine. Like I think like we need some enjoyment, we need some engagement. Like recreation is a part of life. But just like asking yourself what the intention is behind the use, I think is, is perhaps the most productive way to, to go forward from there. Thank you, David, for your uh, talk. Um, in regards to the resistance piece and the um, political economy of industrialized societies piece. Um, I was wondering, in terms of this, uh, we had a conversation about um, how it's not just the DMT, it's not just uh, these single molecules, but sort of uh, collectives of molecules, bacteria, microbes working together in order to interface with our own inner body ecology. And as we're destroying this complexity and these networks that have been around for billions of years. Um, how do you think that uh, our own ability to access these spaces themselves is also being perhaps degraded? Question one. And two, vis-a-vis -vis technology, um, are you a Luddite? Or what do you suggest as a, a real sustainable way forward? Okay, so the first question was, <laughs> was uh, the destruction of everything and how that affects. So personally, like being having always been in a paradigm where this is going on, I don't know. Like I can't draw a comparison, right? Like with what it looked like before that. Um, 
that said, you know, there seem to be relevant messages, like in talking to other people, seeing that eco, like this message of ecocide seems to be, you know, not just me that's having this experience. I think that perhaps there might be some sort of systemic reflection on these are things that are going on and need to be stopped. Uh, as far as, as if that's changed, I don't know. But if that's changing the experience of the substance. Oh, if that's changing the experience of the substance, again, like, it seems to be somewhat in the, the unknowable realm of, of the experience. As to the second question, I'm not a Luddite. I believe in, in using technology in ways that, like, I think that the technology that exists in the world can be used to oppose uh, these systems, I think it will be necessary in order to, like I couldn't, I wouldn't be here, right, if not for the plane that took me here, if not for the internet to, to spread all of these ideas and engage with like wonderful people that are on different continents. But at the same time, it's like, this is the world that we were born into and now that we have these understandings about what's here, I think again, the question is, how can we leverage the things that exist into, you know, sort of overturning what, what we find destructive and building a new world or new worlds and, um, oh, there was another part of, part of that. Uh, yeah, that ultimately, like, what a sustainable society looks like, you know, when people talk about alternative energies like wind and uh, solar and all these things, they're usually neglecting the fact, you know, you can't have wind without pulling rare earth minerals out of the ground in, say, China, refining it, shipping it around the world. So I think ultimately, like, we'll have to look at, I guess you could call it like a waste economy of like perpetual sort of upkeep of things that have, you know, at, at a certain point, we're going to have to stop production if we want to, you know, continue to have some ecological beauty. Hey, thanks for the speech and especially your experience sharing. Um, like when you talk about you met the aliens and the South, like we've all been there. But my question is, do you think this experience actually comes from an external voice or it's just within your consciousness or subconsciousness? Thank you. So I think that there are levels. I think that there are experiences that seem almost unquestionably to be subconscious that like reflect to ourselves and our own psyche, our emotional states of being. And I think that those are usually really easy to identify. Then there are experiences that, at least for me, are so sort of ontologically challenging and paradigm shattering that the, the notion that this is coming from somewhere else, right? Like at the point where you're seeing uh, incredibly complex machinery tesseracting in front of your eyes, like you have that sense of, I couldn't imagine this. I didn't even know it was possible to see such things. And so, I mean, maybe, you know, there's, there's the possibility that perhaps there's some sort of uh, mental architecture that, that is generating this, that these are processes that are uh, running through the mind. Some people have suggested that it's just random neurons firing, but these things always seem to be so coherent and so well put together. You know, Dennis McKenna said at one point, like, if you're, if, if you're looking for an unambiguous message, what could be more unambiguous? Like, here you are presented with starships and aliens and this, that, and the other, and technologies. And, you know, I don't have any proof that it is or it isn't. It's certainly something that, that I'm open to the idea of just because the experiences seem to present such functionally autonomous realms and, and beings and things that, you know, I can't really account for it in any other rational way. Hello. Thank you for the speech. Um, I was wondering, um, we have in the moment of birth and the moment of death and a surge of DMT in our brains, right? Well, that's actually, it's pretty speculative. Um, Rick Strassman and Stephen Barker and, and those wonderful researchers have sort of hypothesized this, and a lot of these hypotheses have kind of run a little rampant. Um, so like, we don't have proof that DMT is produced in the pineal gland. Uh, there's a, a methyl transferase that they haven't really shown to be present and functioning. Right now, there's really good evidence that it's produced in the lungs. We've shown, or they've shown that there's there's the presence of DMT in the pineal, but there's still questions about whether or not it's actively produced there. The question, the question would be, if there is this search, 
could DMT be actually the vessel of our soul? Like, could this be the, the chemical compound to transport the soul into the physical body and out of there in the moment of death? I mean, I guess if, if you know, anything's possible, but there's just, I mean, I don't, I don't have or see evidence, you know, that would necessarily lead me to that conclusion. And personally, I'm a, I would be a little skeptical that a single molecule, you know, if, if there is this, you know, soul to be separated from the body, right, regardless of even if our experiences seem to inform some of this, the notion that it's just tied to one molecule, um, I don't know, it's interesting, but, but I, I don't know, you know, at this point for me, I wouldn't find it to be a particularly compelling realm of thought. David, we only have time for one more. Would you be available to talk to the people in the hub? Yeah, okay. totally. So one more. Sorry, guys. He was first. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. I was wondering, like, I feel like one of the trickiest things uh, is, like, integrating what I've learned in my experiences in uh, the everyday life. Could you comment a little bit on like uh, practical advice is like before, during or after, like stuff like note taking or uh, whether it's DMT or maybe yeah, mushrooms and LSD as well? Sure. Um, keeping like a, a, an experience journal or a trip journal or whatever is something that a lot of people swear by and certainly I've found at times to allow for a lot more memorable retention of these experiences. I mean, at times you come out of an experience and you just feel so floored that it's like, you know, <laughs> how can I take time to write this? But uh, I have a friend who's a, a tattoo artist who basically says that, you know, integration is essentially the process of doing something with your experience. So whether you make art with your experience or you bike ride your experience or, you know, sit and, and play music for your experience, like really trying to figure out ways of, of sitting with what's happened. And I find that at times, you know, just reflecting on it, allowing for quiet times that I wouldn't necessarily call meditation because there's more active thought than that, but just sort of sitting with the experience and, uh, you know, sort of seeing what, what still resonates. As far as, as going into things, um, I think, and this goes back to some of the question about the, the, you know, on the dance floor and the like, I think the set can really, and um, setting can really affect our ability for recall and our ability to, to take meaningful understandings from these experiences. Uh, you know, I've definitely had more than one time at which I've come back and basically just been like, what the hell just happened? Um, either because there were too, there was too much external stimuli or, you know, I hadn't really taken time to, to just prepare myself going in or the dose was too high. Um, but, uh, you know, I think really giving ourselves the most opportunity to have space both going in and coming out to allow for this experience to occur and then really process, reprocess, try to find ways to, to work it into whatever we might be doing. You know, even if it's just like making dinner and sort of like as you're going through the same old repetitive motions, just sort of like reflecting, especially like even on the somatic feelings of, of what it was, you know, especially if you had like an ecstatic, a truly ecstatic or even maybe a, a discomforting experience, you know, what, what in you is it that, that feels such joy or that feels such discomfort? And maybe that can inform some insight as to, to what's needed to engage with that in a more full manner. So let's give a round of applause for David Nichols. Thank you.